excited about the potential for family ministry experiment. And I hope that even, even if you don't want to formally be a part of it, that, that you might secretly hide out in home in your prayer closet or somewhere and look over at least the newsletter. Because there's so, so much uh, that, that goes with, with, with speaking aloud spiritual truths, with, with speaking about God and with speaking about the works of God, speaking about the things of God, there, there is, according to, to our, our church, I think according to our, our tradition, according to, to Scripture, there is power that comes with the spoken word. I mean, James talks about, about the destructive power of the spoken word. But, but I think as you look at the book and you start in the beginning with Genesis and, and the creative, redemptive powers that come with, with the spoken word for building good things in our lives. Um, so that's why I'm excited about the family ministry experiment. Page after page of this book, we find that the children of Israel are telling and retelling and retelling again the story of God's work in their lives. And, and we see what that does for them. Um, I've been paying attention to the spoken word this week. There have been moments where, where I heard word like idiot and stupid, dummy. I'm looking at two in the front row in particular. Uh, moments where in some circles uh, talking about the difficulty of having a body that's grown old or growing old and it's just not working like it used to. I've been in circles where we've talked great about the weather and we've complained about the weather, where we've criticized politicians, we've criticized the NFL, we've criticized teachers. And I've been in circles where I've heard teachers criticize students and parents alike. You know, and what I, what I notice is, is that, that we as people are very capable of doing a lot of grumbling and complaining. And we don't do as much beneficial speak. We don't say, what is it, where Paul says to speak in such a way as to build up those who hear you. That seems to be less and less of a commonality than, than the, the putting people down and the grumbling and the complaining. Friday we had the privilege of going, the privilege, the privilege of going to the fall meeting of North Central Presbytery and, and Nathan got to go on his first big outing and, and it was a blast, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> You know, we, we had a workshop early in the morning that lasted until lunchtime, and then we went back at, after lunch and we started in on the business of presbytery. And I'll be honest, sometimes it's a little dry. And sometimes it's, it's like, do we really need to meet to, to make this decision? It's not that big a deal. You know, and, and so we're sitting there and we're going through report after report, and, and and I thought, man, I, I could almost fall asleep. And Nathan already picked up a pew pillow. He was getting ready to... Uh, but, but we got through with our final report. And the moderator of Presbytery said, at this time, we're just going to pause in the business of the day. And, and I'm opening up the floor. If, if you're here today and, and, and God has laid a testimony on your heart to share, or, uh, uh, God has given you a reason to stand and publicly declare His praise, the next little bit, we're going to do that. And it got about that awkwardly quiet for just a minute. And then people started standing up. And I, I honestly, I can't remember this ever happening at a presbytery meeting in my life where, where one guy started talking about his whole salvation experience and how it was the anniversary of, of when the Lord used someone at his job in the middle of the night to lead him into a relationship with Jesus and how, how he had, had, had gone and evangelized his whole family following that. And then there was a lady who, who got up and talked about the physical healing of her daughter who, who has for years suffered with the, uh, the effects of Lyme's disease and how now all of a sudden she's been able to go back to work 
And after being pretty much an invalid for years, she's now back in the swing of things. And, and I'm like, man, this is kind of exciting. I'm glad that I came. I wish we'd have done this at the start, but, but, but this is, and, and story after story after story kept being shared by people who wanted to get up and talk about the good things that they had seen God do in their life, in their church. In, uh, one guy stood up and said, said, last week I didn't even get to preach. That's where I got excited when the microphones were all breaking. He said, I didn't even have to preach my sermon. He said, we, we started doing, doing praise time at our church, and this guy stood up, and, that, and, and before you know it, our whole hour had been used up sharing about the wonderful things that God had been doing in the life of their church, in their community, and through their ministries. And, and, and I mean, you could just see people starting to get excited, and they were sitting on the edge of their seat, and, the, and, 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 I, and I thought, Wow. I've never been to a presbytery meeting like this before. Or an elders meeting, very rarely a church service where, where, where God was honored so much in, in the verbalizations that people were making. So, what's the point? In 30 minutes of praises and testimonies, not only was my attitude changed, but the atmosphere of our presbytery meeting changed. And, and I, I, was, I, I was trying to process it all, and I, I even had my own praise that I wanted to share, and I, I did. But, but I'm processing all that, and I'm going, wait a minute, this is exactly what the family ministry experiment is all about. When we begin to praise the Lord... We find out that He's not nearly as distant as we once thought Him to be. And that He's not, uh, our problems aren't nearly as big as they once seemed to be. When we start lifting up Christ, when we start honoring and exalting the name of Jesus in our gatherings, we do, like the song says, the stuff of earth grows strangely dim in light of His glory and grace. Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 32, when I when I am lifted up above the earth, I will draw all of humanity unto myself. And obviously, he, he was talking about his crucifixion when they lifted him up on the cross. And then, and then maybe even he's talking about his ascension when he returns to the Father and, and he releases the Holy Spirit on us. But I thought there's got to be a little bit of practical application in the daily living of our lives as well here. When we lift up the Lord in our conversations, when we lift up the Lord in, in our relationships, when we lift up the Lord in our comings and our goings, God draws near to us in a very special way. The Scripture that, that instantly came to my mind is one that I share often, but I, I, never really, I never really looked at it much. But it's from Psalm 22, verse 3, where we're told that the Lord inhabits the praises of His people. I don't know how many times I've shared that, but, but I never looked at its fullness in, in the context in which it sits. So I wanted to share that with you for just a moment this morning because I think it meets where a lot of us find ourselves more often than not. Psalm 22, beginning in verse 1. David cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, and yet I find no rest. I mean... This is obviously not the start of one of those, those happy elements of the story, is it? I, I mean, here, these are the same words that, that Jesus uses as He cries out in agony from the cross as He bears the sins of all humanity. My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? David appears to be in a pretty down emotional place. He appears to be, to be at the end of his rope. Verse 3, Yet you are holy, 
enthroned on the praises of your people. In your fathers, I, I tr- in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not even a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let Him deliver Him. Let Him rescue Him. For He delights in Him. And that's how the psalm continues to play out. Is that David is desperate to encounter the Lord. David is desperate to, to feel the closeness and the presence of the Lord that so often he had enjoyed. And yet in the midst of his desperation, he cries out, God, You are holy. You sit enthroned on the praises of Your people. And, and then he begins to work us through the, the history of God dealing with the children of Israel again. And he talks about how God rescued them and how God answered their prayers and how God heard them. And, and, and then he continues a little bit farther. And, and, and all of a sudden, what you notice is that David's despair isn't quite as desperate as it was at the beginning. And you notice that there's a little more rope at the end than, than what there seemed to be at the start. But, but David, in his problems, David, in his crisis, begins to lift up the name of the Lord. And as he does, the Lord meets him in the middle of his mess and he begins to work change. Change in his attitude. I, mean, read through, I, I thought about reading the whole thing, but I already promised the kids that we'd make it short. But you read through the whole thing, and by the end of the psalm, what started out with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, ends with David essentially saying, God, you are good. God, you are trustworthy. God, you are worthy of praise. God, I'm going to keep hanging on to you. I've had a lot of days that start with, oh God, why have you not noticed me? But I haven't... I haven't ended on that same high note. And it's simply because I choose to focus on the negative elements of my life more often than not. I choose to to, to grumble and complain rather than lift up the name of my God. I mean, every one of us have a 100% track record of surviving bad days to this point right now. We're going to continue, and God's going to continue to carry us through. And when our days are done, hey, how bad can it be to step from this life into the next, welcomed into the arms of Jesus? Maybe I need to complain a little less. Maybe I need to grumble a little less. Maybe I, we need to focus more, not on our problems, but on our problem solver and see what God can do in the midst of all of that. That's what family ministry experiment is all about. It's about lifting up the name of Jesus in our homes. It's about maybe not being so whiny about our teachers and about all the homework we have and our inability to do whatever is before us. Maybe we stop at home griping about what gets us down and we start as a family lifting up the name of Jesus and seeing what happens as we do that. God sits enthroned in the praises of His people. I I mean, I I know God dwells in me, and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and God is alive inside of us. Don't get me wrong, but as we lift up the name of Jesus, and as we praise our God, God comes to us in a very unique way, and He there sits enthroned. I don't know if that speaks to you. Maybe it just spoke to me this week and and I'm supposed to preach it to myself. Or maybe maybe you're like David. Maybe you're overwhelmed with the way life is going right now. Maybe you're overwhelmed in relationships or work or in your circumstances. Maybe God does seem distant to you or to your family. The Scriptures tell us that then especially... David's example tells us that that moment especially is the time to lift up the Lord, to bless the Lord's name, and to tell of His wonderful works. You say, well, I mean, that can't always work. And I I don't think it's a, 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 
a tricky little solution for a problem. I think it's God's design for us as we deal with difficult days. God's design for us on being able to maintain an attitude that's that like Christ Jesus. Flip over to the end of the Psalms, the very last Psalm, and I just want to point out how you're not flipping. I just want to point out the ways that we are to bless the Lord are limitless. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourines and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with the sounding of cymbals. Praise Him with loud, clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As we come to the end of this psalm, we find, uh, we find that, that God desires to be praised. And I believe it's because God desires to reveal Himself to us as we praise Him. I'm expecting for our church and for our families, I'm expecting revival to come to us. At Presbytery, they were taught that... that that just maybe we're finally at a place where revival might happen again. And that presbytery meetings would be full and that we'd be starting new churches and and strengthening old congregations. Revival is coming. I expect it to happen in our homes as we gather around and we lift up the name of the Lord. I expect it to overflow into our church as we continue to gather and bless the name of the Lord. Scripture says that He is holy, that He sits enthroned in the praises of His people. You want to encounter God? Know how to. I know how to. We encounter God as we lift Him up in our praise. May we pray. God, this morning, I thank You that you long that you long to meet with us and to dwell with us and to dwell in our praises god that you long to change not only our attitudes but but our atmospheres and our our our, our environments as we worship you God, most of us, we find it so easy to look at our problems and so easy to focus on our obstacles and so easy to look at the stuff of earth and become overwhelmed. And what Your Word seems to say over and over again is that if we would only fix our eyes on You, the author and perfecter of our faith, we could endure all things and find that in that enduring, we thrive. That we experience You in very close proximity. So God, this morning for all of us, I pray. I pray that we would learn to take our eyes off of things down here and fix our eyes where You are. God, that we would, even in the midst of trial and hardship, that we would still be able to declare that You are good, that You are trustworthy, and that You are holy. And that in doing that, God, find that You meet us with revival. That You renew our spirits. That You restore our souls. That You give us new strength. God, have Your way in us. Raise up people who are eager to tell of Your wonderful works. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.